In English. We're very happy to have you here, Sharon. Tonight we have Sharon Johnston from the Los Angeles based office Johnston McLee with us. We're very happy and lucky to have her in the school. Um, her visit is part of the program um, for the competition of the extension of the campus, uh, on which she will be competing in the next month. I don't want to make this introduction much longer, just to mention you that we have a new poster with all the activities of this semester available, so if I didn't hand one to you, please, you can take one afterwards. And I would like to give the microphone to Diego Raigada, who is a teacher of the school, who is the director of the representation department, who is a long time collaborator, friend, associate of Sharon and Mark, to continue with this brief presentation uh, before hearing Sharon. Thank you all for coming. Diego? Okay. In English also uh, for Sharon. So it is a pleasure to be here this evening introducing Sharon Johnston's lecture because both uh, Sharon with her office, Johnston Margley, and the Ditella University, I think they have been very important references for the discipline in the last couple of decades, but they have never crossed paths. And to, to die for the first time, these two worlds are meeting. They were also very important for myself personally. I think, of course, that's a very good thing. I have met Sharon uh, many years ago while I, I was studying at U UCLA in Los Angeles with Mark Lee as a professor. Eventually, um, I spent a year and a half working in their office. I really, I was really seduced by their work and um, we collaborated uh, after that, even in a house in Argentina that um, is in Rosario and also in some other occasions uh, in biennales and exhibitions we also did small collaborations. I was trying to recall today what was it that drew me to their work when I was in Los Angeles and I think it was that I was uh, a foreigner there but their work seemed very familiar in a way, I felt close to it but at the same time it felt completely challenging, strange and new and I, I thought how, how can those two notions happen together. And in the last year, I think I understood that this happens because their work, especially in this contemporary world that is very Manichaean, like good or bad, I like it, I don't like it. Their work is different because it seems to navigate assimilating opposites rather than resisting from a very extreme position. It is in between uh, globalized and local conditions, history, and innovation, engineering, and art, top-down or bottom-up bottom up approaches, that their work finds its unique sensitivity and reflects the complexity of the contemporary times. And I think that's its main uh, value. So Sharon is a founding partner of Johnson Mark Lee, together with her partner Mark. Since they started in 1998, the firm has been recognized with over 50 major awards a book on the work of the firm entitled House is a 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 House was published by uh, Barbie Hauser in 2016 and their monographs include the 2G magazine, El Croquis and uh, A plus U. And Sharon is also a professor in practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Through tw 20 years of practice, Johnston Marley has established a significant portfolio of work centered around arts and cultural communities. Johnston Marley has served as architect for preeminent cultural organizations internationally, including the Menil Foundation, the Kunstmuseum Basel, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, 
the Whitney Museum and UCLA Arts. Johnston Marglick's work is held in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Art Institute in Chicago, the Menil Collection, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Carnegie Museum of Art, and the Architecture Museum of TU Munich. This year, Sharon and Mark were honored by the American Academy of Arts and Letters with the prestigious Arts and Letters Award in Architecture. So, welcome Sharon, and thank you for being here. Okay, great. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Diego, thank you. Thank you, everybody at the school. I felt really um, welcomed and um, had this. this is my first trip to Argentina, and uh, it's been wonderful to be at the school. It's really impressive. I think the architects have carved out the best space in the campus, and wonderful to see the architecture library is back with the architecture studio. So, um, excellent. Um, so, thank you, Diego. It's been a pleasure to be reconnected with you after so many years of just um, not being together. And tonight, I'm going to just do a brief introduction just to talk a little bit about the sort of origins of our practice. I'll say a few words about the importance of the house in our work, and then I will present a collection of projects, sort of art campus projects, um, just to give you uh, an overview, and I hope that we can have some conversation um, at the end. So um, we basically, our very first projects at Johnston Markley were in the city of Marfa, Texas. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with the work of Donald Judd, um, the, an artist who left New York and went to Marfa. And we worked with an art foundation creating these very modest buildings, transforming 1920s houses into studios, mainly for writers, but very modest vernacular buildings. And I think what was most important out of that work was beginning to build a, a culture, a community of, of like-minded um, artists and other collaborators. And in a way, that's really been the community that's kind of we've formed around our practice. And it's been both an intellectual community, um, a, a community of ideas, but also one of, um, of projects. And I think for, for a lot of you students, the idea of one building a culture of, of, of like-minded travelers, people that will become your collaborators and maybe your clients is a really important thing. So we began to work with artists creating exhibitions, creating objects. This is with the artist, uh, American artist Wally Beshti. We started creating um, exhibition spaces and galleries in the sort of industrial vernacular urban um, buildings in, in Southern California. And I think even at these small-scale buildings, it really helped us start to think about how a, a relatively small building and a building of culture can have a, maybe an outsized impact on how one imagines the city and even inhabits it in the way that artists might um, use the space or misuse the space. We worked. Uh, we work with um, art production spaces. Um, the the sort of. Um, the artist Sam Francis, who's no longer alive, we created kind of laboratories for his art production studio. We also work a lot with museums creating exhibitions, so um, both with living artists and, and dead artists. This is the work of Laszlo Moholy-Naj, but having that exchange with curators um, and artists together is really an important part of how we um, frame a lot of the ideas in our work. And so um, I think the house for us is um, important, both as a kind of origin story, some of our earliest projects like this Adobe house, very, very simple, very inexpensive building in, in Marfa, um, began to be a place of experimentation. It's, it's for architects in, in Southern California, I would say the house is, um, residential architecture is really the signature in a way of Southern California. And so the house um, became a place of, of early exploration for us. But um, most of our house projects always have a kind of very particular cultural um, kind of orientation, uh, whether it's a, the previous house was for a musician or this is just a simple artist studio. Um, this is a house in Southern California that we created um, with an artist not who was one of our collaborators who helped us think a lot about color, the artist Jeff Elrod. This is on the site of a sort of famous house by Morphosis from the mid-70s, the 2468 studio. Uh, and uh, also thinking about the house more than just a domestic space, but often our clients are involved in politics. This particular person um, really thought about the house as both a domestic space, but also a place of exchange. Um, and of course, given our interest in art, houses for art, um, both as dwelling spaces, but also as exhibition spaces. 
and um, small pavilions, buildings that were, in this case it was part of a biennial that was designed for one function during the biennial and is now transformed um, into a center for photography in Shanghai. Uh, and then lastly, this, um, this house in, in, it's just finishing in Kyoto, um, in this case a family that had very specific rituals about um, viewing the landscape in Kyoto and also um, uh, tea ceremonies, so kind of very, um, very personal uh, way of thinking about um, dwelling. <laughs> so, just to speak very briefly about a couple of, of houses that I think speak to maybe a little bit more deeply why the house continues to be important to us, despite the fact that we we probably do less than we used to, and part of that has to do with um, its scale uh, and also. The fact that, especially in Southern California, it gave us the chance to think about very specific sort of ecologies of Southern California. In this case, the Hill House, one of our very first projects, um, but a kind of ubiquitous type of the hillside house. And so, given this very steep slope, it was a problem of thinking about how to have the most minimum footprint, which is because the foundation is the most expensive, and the maximum volume. So. Um, it looks in a way quite simple, but maybe to date it's still one of our most complex structural projects because of the way that the cantilevers work um, with the slope of the house. Um, another important uh, sort of ecology in Southern California is the beach, and in a way it's a kind of underexplored um, uh, ecology for architects. Um, of course there's some notable houses like Craig Elwood, um, among a few other modernists in Southern California, but the vault house it's in a tsunami zone, so in a way it looks quite picturesque here, but it's actually quite a challenging and dynamic ground plane. And so um, the whole front of the house has to be lifted off the ground, and that the, the level of this, the sand can change, you know, ten feet in in, in a very short period of time. Um, but one of the interesting kind of typological challenges of this house, um, of the beach house, is it's typically very long and narrow. So the view that you have at the ocean is very different than you have um, at the, let's say, where the car enters the house. So for us, our first move here was to introduce a courtyard, which you can see just in the middle of the house where that stair is. So the intention across the length of the house, which is 140 feet long, was to draw the light and air and view all the way through so you could actually see the ocean from the back of the house. And so this integer of the vault is a room. All of these spaces are oriented in the same direction so that you can be in the back of the house and see all the way through and, of course, um, have light and air. And then lastly, um, although not in Southern California, this is um, the view house that we created together with Diego and, and our kind of imagination about these ecologies. This is um, the house about the suburban plot. And I think as we initially designed it, it was thinking about kind of offsetting the typical um, setbacks that you find you're given in a brief for a house of front and side yards and thinking about a building in the round. And um, we found this special parcel um, in, in, a, in a newly developed site in Rosario. And so um, I think it was very much about using um, with Diego, who, who helped us um, develop the house technically and oversaw construction, to think about the kind of vernacular of construction, uh, concrete construction um, in this context. And so it's called the View House. It's really about a panorama as you move through the house. Different views open up to you, but you you're always feel like you're moving from, the, from outside to inside. And each one of these folded planes um, is, is imagined to create kind of an interior landscape that baffles light and um, modulates the views back out. Um, as you move up the house, you sort of ultimately come to this door, which um, opens up to a sort of oversized uh, stair that takes you up um, to the roof, and you kind of have this panorama again. So I think um, the sort of human scale of this house, the idea of thinking about it both as a domestic space, but a place of movement and a place of engaging with a much bigger territory through the way that the views orient you is, is important. And so just to conclude um, about these ideas of the house that I hope you'll see transform and, and, and in play um, in the institutional projects, the campus work that I'll show you, I think there's something about the sort of human scale of the house that we're always coming back to, the intimacy of the house, the, the kind of notions of comfort and scale, and also um, the idea of it being a place of experimentation. So in this project, for example, um, at UIC, it was a, a finalist for a competition for a performing arts center, thinking not only about the massing, how the building meets the ground, but that in-between space as a garden, um, a sort of threshold between the campus and the city, 
or this um, factory that we're um, in the early design stages for outside of Tokyo. Um, it's both a working factory, but it's also a cultural art center. So thinking about the porch and the kind of art park is a threshold between industry and um, the residential fabric around the building. Or lastly, this is a project we're just getting started in, in partnership with Kristen Gantenbein in Basel. Uh, it's a renovation of the, the old um, Kunstmuseum, the Hotbau in Basel. And a lot of um, our, our work is thinking about um, breaking down the sort of presence of this large, historic, important building through introducing art terraces and new gardens and creating this much more ephemeral and almost diaphanous scale um, in relationship to the historic building. So I think um, the projects that I'm going to present, seven projects, so three that are in a sort of more traditional campus um, of sorts, and then one sort of wild card, and then a couple of museums. And this idea of art urbanism has been um, a theme that we've been thinking about um, since really early in our practice. The idea of not the museum as a monument or the building um, of a, as, as a singular, but thinking about a building as part of a constellation or a collection and looking both at history, looking at the kind of fabric as it's evolved over time and offering clues for how to think about um, making architecture. So from, you know, of course, Marfa where we started to um, this is the Manila campus where we finished the building or the Dia work on um, the south part of Manhattan, maybe some of you guys have seen that, to Serpentine, um, Jinhua in China, Homebroek, all great examples of this sort of collective urbanism. And so the first project is a competition that we won in Chicago. It's, it's just west, or I'm sorry, it's yeah, west of um, the University of Chicago, which is down here. So the Obama Library is sort of down in this area. That's Washington Park. And an artist maybe some of you guys are familiar with, Theaster Gates, um, incubated this uh, new program. It's called Art, Arts and Public Life. So Theaster redeveloped this, this sort of block that's rendered in this white block um, as a place for... Um, Arts education, it's, it's probably one of the poorest and most violent places in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. And slowly, Theaster has been building back, renovating, and adding new buildings um, into this block. So this is called the Green Line Arts Center, and it's a place that um, is, incubates um, artists, collectives for theater, dance, film, um, in this new house. So it's not a home for any one organization, but it's a flexible space that students also become part of. And so here the urbanism is one sort of about emptiness, the unbuilt, but this is a collection of um, buildings that Theaster has been redeveloping over time. And so it's a hybrid of industrial buildings, um, houses like, like this one, the listening house. So a very diverse and sort of porous fabric. And our, our building sits within an existing building. And so um, the idea for us was to, we needed to preserve this historic shell and slip in a very um, kind of light, simple, modular structure that would accommodate the bays um, and be incredibly flexible because it was a, a project that we knew would be adapted over time. So it sits um, within the sort of existing fabric of, this is an art gallery on the corner and, and, and kind of theater school teaching how to make theater props and then the Astro has a restaurant and then the Green Line Art Center and then the, the Green Line runs um, north-south right next to the building. So it has a very um, informal profile. It's not a theater like you would see maybe in a traditional downtown center, but a kind of a hybrid of a t house type and an industrial shed. And in the way that those um, modular bays work, it allows it to be very simple as a theater, a sort of rehearsal space, a black box, and then another flex space. And uh, alternatively, um, uh, all of those doors can open. It can be one community space. So I think this is very much a, um, a, very, um, a building that is imagined to, to transform um, over time and with each day. And so here's the existing facade. It's sort of a terracotta brick, um, pretty anonymous in a way. But I think part of what the Astros program has been to bring a, a kind of radical transparency to this site, where you might imagine being really defensive and blocking people off, creating a sort of reciprocity of the front facade um, that allows for visual uh, transparency all the way through the building. So very informal spaces for, for film, um, for rehearsal performance. And these spaces are um, flex spaces where musicians could come, a class could happen, um, and at the same time they're a kind of important part of the environmental performance is sort of thermal buffer zones. So they gather heat in the, in the, in the winter and evacuate heat in the summer. Um, 
but once again are sort of programmatically indeterminate. And then here's the second one of those that's um, open to the south side of the building. And one of the great things about um, working with the Aster is he's a sort of a hoarder of materials. And so the project, we ended up having to move the site, so this particular building here won't be built. But um, working with him on developing a facade idea with uh, his collection of bricks. So the sort of uh, way in which the front and back facade feel almost the same was a really important part of our urban response um, to make it feel like a building that both had program inside of it, uh, of course, but that it could host um, activities with, within the city, that it had that level of porosity. Um, so here is its sort of urban position, just a little bit shift in scale in the way that the windows um, and um, the sort of proportion of the volume. And I think for projects like this that are often, first of all, very low budget, but also need to have a sort of almost entrepreneurial way that they um, imagine their future, we thought about this module of structure that could also expand over time, um, be a sort of stage or an indoor-outdoor workshop um, with relative ease um, and, and cost-effectiveness. Um, so the next project is um, for the UCLA Graduate Art Studios. It's one of the most important um, public art um, MFA programs in the States. And it's not on the UCLA campus, which maybe some of you have been in Westwood, but in an um, industrial place called the Hayden Track. So a kind of um, campus-like um, situation you might find in LA, but not in the academic sense. So it's been there from the 80s. It's a kind of innocuous warehouse with a bunch of kind of barnacle buildings around it. And so on the one hand, this is a place that maybe, some, hopefully not too many of you guys know this work, but this is the work of, of Eric Moss, I'm, I'm kidding, but on the one hand, Eric Moss has sort of developed this site with one developer, so it's sort of this playground of these very exuberant buildings. On the other hand, it still has traces of this sort of anonymous Southern California industrial landscape, which is, um, I guess you could see those layers of this of this site in these three registers, and um, as, you can imagine we were most interested in this top band. Um, the artist Louis Baltz, some of these are photos of his work, the sort of very anonymous, generic Southern California landscape was something that we felt was not only appropriate urbanistically, but for the program. So here's the building and the warehouse that we, we preserved is, is in the back, and our addition is basically this L that wraps around the building and has some of the more bigger scale labs and public programs. Um, uh, the project is uh, constructed out of tilt-up concrete construction. Diego and I have been talking a lot about construction techniques, and I guess that's not that prevalent here, but it's a very basic, you pour, you make a mold, you pour the concrete on the floor, and then you just tilt it up. So, for example, all of these walls were erected in two days. So they pour it, it cures, and then it's lifted up. And you can subtly see this is a bay and a tilt-up wall, and then the columns, which are cast in place, are also pillowed. So we wanted to really have a very abstract, kind of generic facade, and then these large openings, which are the open-air yards, where the students bring in materials and um, produce their work. You enter the building through a garden. So these are covered but unconditioned spaces. So this is a classroom. It's a place to they, they have a barbecue. It's a really informal space for crits. And... Um, whatever else the students want. Uh, so this is just, there's no faculty here, it's just, a, I mean, the faculty come for crits, but it's really just a studio space. The second uh, open air yard is very large in scale. The top of that wall is about 28 feet, and then it vaults up from there. So these are really big span volumetric spaces for the students to make really large scale work. And then they're, they're covered with a kind of Lexan that controls the light um, and diffuses light, but it's, but it's open air. So we got a lot of square footage that we didn't have to condition, but it's highly functional. And as an art building, it's a really um, inexpensive building, so all of the detail was made into the mold for the walls. So these, these pillow forms are part of what was the concrete was cast into, and then there's a few specialty details like, like this corner and the cornice. So that really where the building comes to life is just simply in the way that light plays on the building. It's quite cinematic as the light moves, trees um, sort of blow against it, um, but it's, there's almost, there's just really one detail. And then inside the studio, it's a kind of neighborhood of studios, so 41 studios that are built in a pretty informal way if they ever needed to transform them, and then the overscale hallway is never looks like this, it's full of stuff, but um, we thought a lot about this sort of informality of multifunctional spaces 
at every, um, from circulation to, to the studios um, themselves. And so each artist has their own studio, but they're connected through, the, there's an open air ceiling, so there's really a sense of community in the building. And then during the crit times when um, the public comes, each one of those studios is transformed to a gallery. So it's, it's really adaptable. And then there's a couple of larger scale spaces um, like this one where um, a little bit more formal exhibition spaces uh, or exhibitions can be staged. So I think the building almost feels um, anonymous, um, feels very much part of this background fabric, which we felt was appropriate given it's an inst the only institutional building in this sort of industrial and commercial landscape. And so it's that sort of in-between that Diego was talking about. This is something that we strive for. Um, and this project was a competition that we were finalists for at Rice University in Houston. And Rice um, was founded in the early uh, 20th century. It sort of has this sort of neo-Byzantine um, brutalist style, um, very, on one, on the one hand, quite a formal campus. But our uh, project was for a new art campus. So it was visual arts, dramatic arts, um, so theater, photography, um, and studio art. And it was uh, at a new um, edge of the campus that hadn't been developed yet. So um, our proposal, we, we, we have come to sort of think about it like a, we call it the sort of work palace, which is a hybrid between um, an industrial shed and a palazzo. A palazzo is a type that we're really fascinated with because it is, we feel, one of the really most adaptable building typologies um, given its scale and the kind of clarity of its plan. And so the building um, is really a building in the round, um, but, but kind of unique urban conditions. So it's, um, it's a brick building and each, each facade, it's, we think of it a bit like a kind of woven facade where each face is largely brick, but responds to the really diverse um, urban order that surrounds it. And then within the building, it's really um, not in a way unlike the Green Line Arts Center. It's a very simple um, industrial kind of language of um, metal decks, poured concrete, and steel frames. So really easy to adapt to different kinds of staging for the students, different kinds of events, singular studios, collective studios. Um, really the thing that we were most rigorous about was always thinking about the art spaces relative to daylight. Um, so it sort of really can kind of almost plug and play in a way as the building um, evolved. It was designed in phases, so the last phases would have theaters and larger scale volumes and then finally an MFA program. So the fabric of rice is very eclectic. Um, James Sterling did quite a beautiful building there for the architecture school, um, but it kind of brick, um, vernacular brick construction in Texas is can be really rough and, and not that elegant or, or quite refined. And so our project um, tries to draw on that lineage and, and think about um, a kind of tapestry-like way to think about the brick um, and different orientations on the building. Um, it sits right next to this, this building here on the left side of the slide is um, a building by Michael Maltzen. Maybe some of you guys know this building. And it's, it's kind of like the formal museum um, that is in relation to the art school. So we're the sort of dirty building, and that's the finished building. But it was kind of a, a no man's land. So part of, um, I think, in terms of thinking about campus architecture was, was really thinking precisely about all, different, all, all the sides of the building and creating a sort of highly functional space between the museum um, and the art school. So it's all of those yards spill out. In a way, it sort of reminds me a little bit of this courtyard, that it's it's both clear in its architecture, but the, it's quite porous in the way that students can use it. Um, and then on the inside, it's um, volumetric, it's big, it's raw, it's very much um, thinking about creating as much visual porosity as we can um, to, to um, allow students to discover the different disciplines that happen um, within the building. The studios are always on the top, so they're um, filled with daylight, north light and are um, built in a very simple kind of industrial shed-like construction. Um, so this project is sort of the interlude between um, those m more campus-like um, projects and the, the, the museum projects. And this is um, a project that's called Philadelphia Contemporary. It's in West Philly. And it is a building that was designed not to own anything in a way, but to be just a really great partner with uh, Drexel University is right next door, and also Penn. So two really, you know, pretty excellent universities that didn't, I mean, Penn has a museum, but 
felt like this sort of experimental type of um, art institution was something that could also connect them to the neighborhood, which is a really challenged, um, historically, black community that has had a lot of sort of racially charged um, episodes over the years. So it was, a, it was a way to sort of build a home that everyone could share. So it's a kind of eclectic campus architecture. This is a Venturi building um, in the upper left, um, Adele Santos, kind of various um, kind of somewhat notable um, institutional buildings. Uh, and then the other sort of main fabric are these um, brick buildings that are part of these neighborhoods of Mantua and Palatin, really um, areas that are had a lot of challenges in recent years. And so our first approach in the competition was to think about the building as really a piece of infrastructure, almost like scaffolding, almost build it like a, like a parking garage. And these sheds um, would be spaces that artists could activate. And there was a whole thing about, about the way the building could be built almost in the city. And these pavilions could be brought to the structure when the building was finished. But as the project evolved um, and all the sort of vagaries of construction and all of that, it, it developed into more of a kind of simple shed like this building um, with uh, these table structures. And I think part of the approach to thinking about the sort of diversity of these neighborhoods in this new kind of urban campus that um, we needed to solve for was thinking about the museum experience starting out in the city, that these, these pavilions would be activated by artists or spaces for kids for learning, and that you began the museum experience in the city. So um, just a quick walk around the building. It's really a building in the round, so the front and the back kind of orientations were, we tried to really um, play that down. So everything from where art comes in the building to cooking outside, it really was a kind of inside out museum. Um, so I think another important part of this project was um, kind of going back to what I was talking about at the beginning about the sort of intimacy and thinking about how people approach a building of this scale was was pulling the building back and creating a really lively open space so that in a way you could pass by the site and never go into the building but have a sense of, um, of a kind of common experience um, with people in the city. And so these part of the work of these tables is both programmatic with this was, for example, a DJ booth. This was an artist's garden. There was a camera obscura. But also just to make a kind of shelter um, underneath, um, underneath the building. So things like art loading that you see here, all of that was sort of part of the working life of the museum, which oftentimes is hidden and invisible. And we tried to put forward with sort of equal weight to um, the kind of more front of house ex exhibition uh, programs. So inside the building, it's um, a very simple concrete structure. We thought of them as concrete tables that just simply stack on top of each other. And then programmatically, you know, the art experience would begin right when you walked in the door. There was all kinds of cool sort of programs like Harbor Spaces where partner organizations would, would have um, a part of the floor for programmatic activity. So it was very loose boundaries um, and, and very flexible. Education was a big part of this museum, um, and so putting the classroom, which is, really takes place outside on this, on this um, terrace, as much as inside, was, was foregrounded. Um, and so here's that classroom on the inside looking out. So this artist um, was pro proposed this camera obscura, so thinking about how to see the city back um, through, through the way that it was sort of turned inside out. And then, you know, really thinking about the urbanism, um, the position of the building, the mass of the building in relationship to these large sort of institutional um, lab buildings of Drexel and these kind of beautiful but forlorn brick buildings um, of the neighborhood to try to find an in-between scale um, between that, that kind of important history um, and this kind of rapidly changing um, intellectual kind of campus architecture. And then lastly on the roof was a very kind of simple truss structure where um, performance galleries like this kind of black box and then a more traditional um, light-filled uh, exhibition gallery. And of course the exterior was this also a gallery space, so really thinking about not only art but food and all different kinds of participatory um, programs that were part of um, the kind of flow and life of the, of the building. Um, the MCA is maybe some of you guys that were in Chicago, uh, maybe it's too, too, you guys are too young, but um, in 2017 and a little bit before that, we um, started this project for the MCA in Chicago. 
And um, Chicago is sort of an, an interesting city for museums because they're pretty much all museums in the park. So it's obviously a really clear grid. Um, but there's this legacy of great museums and the kind of urbanism of them is around the building um, in the landscape. And the MCA was designed by the German ar architect um, Joseph Paul Kleihus. It was finished in the mid-90s. So pretty um, tough, gridded building. Um, Kleihus was doing work back in Berlin, adapting um, the Hauptbahnhof. So thinking about the train station, the idea of the museum as a place of, of movement, of you're going on a journey, so lifting it up off the ground. Um, but when we um, won this project, I think part of it was that we we said we really needed to fall in love with this building because it's so tough, it's so difficult, and trying to make it into something it's not was just never going to work. So here's some images of the building before we started. The back was always sort of compromised. This is the east side of the building, which faces the river. But a couple of the notable um, architectural elements are these vaulted galleries, which are on the fourth floor. Um, and then this ship-shaped stair, which is really the sort of only thing that you often see people talk about um, with in favorable terms uh, for the museum. So here it is sitting um, in the park. It's surrounded by two parks on either side, but it um, just from the way the architecture was resolved so far, it feels quite disconnected. So we did, we were hired to do a master plan and a phase one renovation, so just a couple of before and afters, but I think one of the key things um, of museum architecture that we think a lot about is about flow and circulation, about connectivity, thinking about never having dead ends. And so here's the kind of before where it was all about dead ends. And then this is the base of the building, so at street level. We moved program around and we ended up adding some stairs and um, new public space. So from a very solid and kind of rigid building, we created much more porosity and fluidity. Um, so here's a before and then an after on the main museum level, which is floor two sort of trying to realize in the end the symmetry of the building, um, largely through new circulation and different access points. In section, the same, it's really a monumental building, so creating a more intimate entry and new space in the back becomes a much more varied um, interior experience. And so in the end, what we, we ended up not working on any galleries, but adding about 15,000 square feet of, of public free space in the building. So always working within this very tight grid of Kleihus. So here's, um, the new, what's called the Commons, and that's a work by um, the Mexican designers Pedro and Iwana, and then we added that classroom floor um, on, the, on the second level. So a lot of time really thinking through the lineage of Kleihus' thinking and trying to um, bring a fresh uh, idea of the museum experience. So this is the ground floor, this new street that we created, so we recall back the vault of the galleries on the top floor with this new acoustical um, ceiling, which also serves us with all the infrastructure and mechanical. So it's a really, um, it's kind of seamless space. It's, it, it forms the foyer for the theater, the silver wall, um, and then a new restaurant, which was placed on the ground floor. This is a project we developed with the uh, um, British um, and Tasmanian artist, um, Chris Ophelia. So Chris worked on a site-specific mural, which you'll see, and we worked a lot with him on the color. So I think that kind of collaboration and testing ideas through the kind of voice of another artist is something we love and was really uh, an exciting part of this project. So this is Chris's work, this mural, um, these, these drawings on the windows. So from a ground floor that was dark and disconnected, it's now really porous and full of light. And at the end of that street is a new stair that we um, introduced that links up to that common space. So not only does it create access, but it also brings daylight into the building. And this, um, I don't have any images of it, but part of our thinking here, of course, in, in studying the Kleihus stair and reimagining it was to think of the stair also as a stage. So it's been pretty cool. A lot of artists and dancers have done performances on this on this stair, um, sort of taking advantage of that, that oversized um, scale of, of the stair itself. And this is the commons. It's a place for artists. It's not really a formal gallery, a lot of public programs, but thinking of this room as a sort of piece of infrastructure that could accommodate all different kinds of um, artist interventions. And then lastly, this is Chris's, um, Chris's mural um, in, in this private dining room. And so in terms of the master plan, we, we, we wanted to really think about how to create a stronger urban relationship the build, of the building to the city. And maybe counterintuitively, our approach was to actually strengthen the edge of the building. So this is the existing, um, and this is our proposed. So creating, not only deleting the edge in a, with a bit more clarity, but also creating kind of smaller scale galleries, pop-up 
um, kind of store window type galleries that would create a more informal um, sense of the edge of the building. And then in the back, this is the existing and this is the new. So thinking about a much more kind of continuous open space that would allow for all the kinds of events um, that happen in terms of in the summer months and art exhibition um, on, the, on the terraces. So here is the future um, MCA where we've transformed the base of the building, made it more transparent and then added an addition in the back. So in contrast to the sort of dull um, matte quality of the cast aluminum, we, we, we thought about a kind of shimmery, kind of um, almost pillow-like treatment to the metal that would then be stitched together by, um, to, by a winter garden. So bringing the garden into the building, creating this informal public space um, in the heart of the building that was also centered around education, classrooms, and such. So very much trying to kind of love um, the order and proportion of Clyhus, but find a new um, kind of scale and atmosphere um, in the proposed future edition. So here's the park before, and then after is a much more flexible, um, kind of undetermined kind of open space garden. And so here's Chicago um, as a city of museums in the park. Um, this project is uh, for a master plan for the MCA, uh, sorry, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Maybe some of you guys know this building from Arata Isosaki. It was finished in the mid 80s. And it's on a street called Grand Avenue in downtown Los Angeles. And it's, of course, evolved quite a lot um, over time. I guess the most recent addition is the Dillerska Video uh, Broad Museum that's here, that's Frank Gehry. It's a number of sort of anonymous um, concert halls. This is a Coop Hemmelbaugh building. This is Maneo. Um, so a pretty significant um, street uh, for architecture in, in Los Angeles. But in many ways, these buildings are very um, autonomous. And they become a kind of collection, but only just through their proximity. And so this is Isosaki's building when it was finished, really. Um, it's a long story that I won't get into. But part of the development of this site that's called Bunker Hill was Instead of having a sort of art program in each building that was these towers that were developed, all of that percent for art went into building a museum. So all of everybody, it was a city, it was a museum for the city. Um, but really in an isolated building when it was first finished. Um, it was, uh, Isasaki was working on museums kind of all over the world at this time, um, also quite involved with Disney. So there's a kind of lineage of, of that sort of pop colors, the pink and green. Um, and these are some of the early drawings uh, um, that Isasaki made, this sort of almost a Kiriko-esque abstract landscape. Uh, but this is how the building and the site have evolved over time, and so in a way a very maybe different vision than he had imagined, which had compromised um, a lot of the sort of presence of the building and its accessibility um, on Grand Avenue. So we first were commissioned to reimagine the public realm of the museum. And so we started literally by just erasing things that made boundaries and edges that um, I think deterred people from entering the site. And then through a series of sort of surgical moves, creating um, a new courtyard, reimagining the um, accessibility paths into the courtyard, um, tried to create a new sort of urban room um, that would be the entry. So when you, you enter the museum from below, um, which was one of the real challenges of this as a kind of urban model of a museum. And then from there, we were asked to um, develop an idea of additional galleries for the museum. And so um, what was really fascinating about this project was the chance to look back and understand Isosaki's work at that period um, in the mid 80s, early 90s. And part of that was a house that he um, designed in Venice in, in, in Southern California at the beach for a collector named Teresa Bronson. And we were fascinated by this sort of um, kind of tectonic of this roof and the way that daylight is really beautiful. I don't have a picture of the interior, but this language felt really appropriate to us and both familiar to the building um, from the 80s, but also kind of very relevant as a contemporary um, proposition. So we proposed to add galleries at either end of the building, and what that ends up doing is almost strengthening this open room, the void of the courtyard in the middle of the block. And brings, of course, daylight is um, a really signature part of this museum, so it um, became a, a, a kind of key way that we could, we could continue that legacy. And so here's the elevation of the building um, and the way that that center void becomes a room. This is immediately across the street from the Broad. So we felt like that um, the mass of that building in relationship to the void of um, the courtyard started to speak in a way that 
made a really an, a beautiful urban room. Um, and here is um, the plan and, and the, the proposal and, and plan. And um, the last project that I want to show you is for the Manila Drawing Institute. It's in Houston. And um, hopefully some of you guys have been there. Of course, um, the very, not the first building, but um, one of the most important buildings on the campus is one of Renzo Piano's earliest museum buildings that was finished in the late 80s, so about the same time that the MOCA building of Isasaki. And uh, a really incredible story. Um, you guys should um, learn a little bit more about the history of this building. It's, a, it's an incredible story about the relationship of an architect and a client. Dominique de Menil um, and her husband, Jean, um, were, were incredibly visionary people um, and committed to social justice and, and incredible collectors. So Renzo um, finished this building um, in the mid 80s. There was a number of other buildings built over time. And so um, in the, around 2010, there was, David Chipperfield was commissioned to do a master plan for the campus. And this is pretty much how he started. Um, this is a building, this is Sai Twombly, this is the Twombly Pavilion, a collaboration between Renzo and Sai Twombly. This is the Rothko Chapel up here. Um, this is a kind of interesting chapel by um, Francois de Manil, it's a Byzantine chapel. And then um, uh, the Flavin building, which is an adaptation of um, a warehouse for a site-specific installation by Dan Flavin. And one of the things that's sort of important about this plan is that this apartment building um, is a couple of acres, and the Manils owned it, and it became, it really funded the museum for many, many years. But when, um, sorry, let me just orient you a little more. So here, it's really a kind of dispersed urbanism. Back to that um, slide I showed you at the beginning of this section of the lecture. Not, I mean, on the one hand, the Manil building, the Manil collection building is really the heart of the building, but these dispersed buildings form this really lovely, um, almost surreal kind of fabric that is also um, interwoven with these pre-war bungalows um, that are, of course, very different in scale uh, and use. Some of them are used by the Manil for office and some are rented out. So this constellation of buildings um, that form this kind of loose urbanism within, it's a 30-acre campus, so it's quite large. And then really what's signature about um, this place is um, the way that daylight fills each one of these buildings in a very different way. And of course, Renzo developed those leaves with Peter Rice, and so this kind of top-lit gallery that really felt, it was very dynamic light, was a really important part of the legacy of museum architecture, I think, um, across the world. And so here are the bungalows. Um, one of the things the Manils did to create some sense of a collection was to paint them, all the buildings they owned, the same color gray. So it has this sort of very, both, both diverse and coherent. And then, of course, the trees are a really important part um, of that fabric as well. And then um, the art. So they have a big collection of Michael Heiser, which is some of the work you're seeing here. So you're always sort of encountering art or, or people looking at art in a very informal way, um, which is quite beautiful. It's, it doesn't feel like an institution. So here was um, some drawings that came from the Chipperfield Master Plan, so sort of a, a before and after. And there was a number of different pavilions planned. And our building, the Drawing Institute, is right here. It's about in the middle of the campus. And um, so that was significant because it's, uh, it's a big campus. It gets really hot in Houston. And so thinking about creating a building in the middle of the campus was important as a kind of way station as people moved across. And so in the competition phase, um, we, we thought about it's a building for drawings. It's quite unprecedented. Oftentimes, spaces for drawings are sort of in the corner, in the back of a building. They're not thought of and maybe with the same importance as, as other forms of or mediums of art. And so we thought about this very thin roof that would just sort of hover over the building, nested amongst the trees in a kind of delicate way that would shelter the, um, the works um, inside. So there's a number of trees that were left over from that big apartment building, and we felt that was an important clue. So we started by building rooms around those trees, and the building really fills in um, around, around those outdoor rooms. So here's a before sort of aerial view, and this is after. And so this kind of necklace, as it's called, of bungalows, um, our building really nestles up very close to those. And so it has a scale that the top of the building is 16 feet, which is um, a little bit more than, uh, I think, four meters. Um, so pretty low lying building that's really nested within the landscape. So here's the elevation um, from the south, and we worked really carefully and closely with a landscape architect called Michael Van Valkenburg. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with his work, but 
for us, you know, the garden, the landscape was, was as important as the building, both, both experientially, but also in terms of atmosphere. So it forms sort of a porch to this new park that's to the south. And then you enter the building on the east and west through a garden courtyard. Both, um, it was important in the way that we calibrated daylight and the light levels in the building, but also it introduced a kind of informal and more intimate scale as a prelude to entering the building. Just a quick note on daylighting. Um, the light in Houston is about 10,000 foot candles, and a drawing gallery um, needs to be five foot candles. So that's a pretty radical shift in scale. And so part of this courtyard, the roofs, the trees, the dark color of the building was all about bringing those light levels down. So you, there's no other shading or kind of mechanical means of creating that transition in the building. So all of these things were really working um, in harmony together. The module of the, these courtyards is 60 feet by 60 feet, so that's a sort of reoccurring. And then the width of this pathway and the, the kind of module of the roof, um, these slope roofs, is 12 is 12 feet. So that kind of course is through. So the minute you enter the building, you you're, have a visual, visual connection back out into the garden. And then this room, we call it the living room. And part of our work in the competition phase was to consolidate a lot of circulation. So instead of a lot of extra corridors, everybody meets in this space, whether you're a museum visitor or a staff. And it's become um, a place for art installations, so not works on paper, but it's, a, it's quite lovely because the way we worked with a really great lighting designer and daylighting designer, largely during the day there's no daylight, there's no artificial light in the room. So the, the, the geometry of the roofs is all calibrated to baffle light and then you always still have these views back out into the garden. This, um, to the south is the gallery, so it's largely, I mean, the south in, in the United States is the area where the moat's kind of the opposite, so a place that we really needed to defend the, the interior against the sun. We do have two windows that are covered in this exhibition of Ronnie Horn, but otherwise um, it's really oriented towards the living room, which is to the north. So it's a lot of study went into creating this gallery. It's, it's in, in feet and inches, it's 12 feet 6 inches, so it's very precisely calibrated for works on paper, which the average size in their collection is sort of like 18 inches by 20 inches, so quite small works. Um, and then this is on the north side of the building where the staff and um, the, the offices and such are, so much more daylight, a different kind of a plant scape. These are magnolias, so the quality, the scale of the landscape and the quality of light um, is quite different. So this is a we call it the scholar courtyard. It's a place of circulation, a place for scholars and residents to work, informal meetings. Um, so it's really dynamic. It changes, um, of course, across the day and the seasons. And then this is the drawing room. It's really the heart of the building where the works on paper come for scholars to study. It's the only room in the building that's top lit where you can study works on paper. And then there's other troughs of daylight. So it's a little bit, it's very primitive in a way, but it can be calibrated for different qualities of light. Um, and then back uh, into the living room in an evening setting. And then now we're on the east side of the building, so a little bit more verdant garden, um, uh, almost more domestic in feeling. This was one of the existing trees that we preserved. I think one of the other things about the building, it's on the one hand quite interior, it needs to really protect the works, but there are moments like this where there's a sort of diagonal view through the building that's quite transparent, so you can see all the way into the scholar courtyard. I think that's another one of those kind of contrasting qualities that we, we, we look for in our work. Um, the building is, uh, we worked with the structural engineer, Guy Nordensen, so it's quite, this is a little bit less than eight inches, so quite thin, and it's spanning um, quite long distance. So there was a lot of work. We, we ended up building this um, with folks that do a lot of ship building. So it's pretty rough in a way, and we like that you start to see some of the ribbing. It has a kind of muscular quality. It's not that precious. Um, so here's that south porch. A lot of times people just walk through here and they don't even enter the building, walking their dogs. So it has this very kind of civic quality and an informal quality to it. Now we're on the west side looking east. You can see the window that's um, into the galleries that can be open. Another glimpse um, in those kind of in-between moments where you get those diagonal views. The project um, was one of, this is a site, there's a tradition at the Manel of um, a sort of commemorative work of art that is for marking the finishing of the building and the people that supported it. So this is one of the last works of Ellsworth Kelly. It's called the Manel Curve, and so it sits just in front of the building, and it's Maybe it's, it's about the same color white, and it's a very reflective white, so it's kind of quite stealthy, but um, a mark of, um, it sits in a nice relationship with the building. 
Um, so this is uh, the last slide, and I think it maybe encapsulates encapsula um, these qualities, you know, between the intimacy of the house and the sort of institutional nature of museum, um, both programmatically and I think also spatially, the sort of way in which the building feels both inside and outside, um, the kind of twilight condition. We, we really love the work of Aldo Van Eyck, and I think he writes really beautifully about uh, the, he calls it the twilight condition of this in-betweenness. I think that's something that um, we strive for, and I think it's you know becomes more and more challenging with bigger buildings. But um, I think a lot of the the, the kind of elements that you see um, in the early houses have carried through um, to these more later projects that are bigger in scale, um, but still you know have that kind of sense of intimacy and, and humanness about them. So thank you so much. So many new works, like the house in Tokyo, we were excited to see. <laughs> and to see more perhaps next time. Yes. Um, I think it was very beautiful that you showed the first slide with uh, the first works by the office that I didn't know. Um, because they felt so familiar. They felt, uh, well, you, you, your last comment was, was what, I, what I was going to say, that the projects change in scale, mm -hmm. change in locations, but they feel the same. Mm -hmm. They feel the same in the scale of the house, the scale of this ambiguity. Uh, and I wanted to ask you um, about your references and your formation, mm -hmm. Mark, because it seems as you have been always doing the same, these objects that have this ambiguity, uh, through a series of forms, uh, the house and the shed, you repeated a lot, mm -hmm. this idea of the industrial shed and this idea of the house. And I also think it's, it's quite remarkable that you ended with this Ellsworth Kelly sculpture, mm -hmm. that it feels so close to, to the world. Mm -hmm. And well, it, it wasn't so much a question, but just to know a little bit more about your reference and, and how you start to uh, with, with this idea of the ambiguity of mm -hmm. form and, and this subtleness mm -hmm. in the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think one thing, um, maybe to say a little bit about, you know, the role of art in the in the practice, um, you know, I think Mark and I met in school um, at the GSD, and we um, were both, I was make, making prints in the Carpenter Center, and Mark was studying um, with, with um, Eva Lambois, maybe some of you guys know his writings as an art historian, and I think, you know, the language of art practice often... Um, has that level of ambiguity. I mean, I think the best work, for us, we feel the best work has those qualities, that um, that it can be two things at once. Um, it can be, um, you know, small and big. We, we, we find those those attributes of, of space and art, um, ones that keep us excited. We keep wanting to come back. We keep wanting to discover. And I think, you know, as we began to, you know, deal with different programs both with the house but beyond the house, I think this sort of programmatic indeterminacy is something that is a, is something that is required of a lot of our work. You know, classroom buildings, buildings that need to be really flexible. I think has made us think about a language of architecture that um, inherent in its form making and, of course, in its use, has that kind of ambiguity that it that can be many things at once. And I don't know if that totally answers your question, but. Um, no, like they yeah. Definitely, definitely yeah. to strike that idea of ambiguity. Because I also think that, uh, or I would also want to ask you about uh, how does technology mm -hmm. and being able to take it mm -hmm. fit into, mm -hmm. into that? Because uh, for a few, just a few words, like the house with the Diego, technology is part of the expression of yeah. the project. But in many of the other cases, it's uh, put into the service of this ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of that, you know, when Mark and I started our practice, Mark had come from four years of teaching and working in, at the ETH in Zurich and um, was, you know, exposed to a pretty exceptional level of construction. And so when we came back to America, um, you know, we, we were very realistic about what, you know, what standards we could, um, we could, we could expect to get. And so a little bit of that is um, defense. 
that we that we are there's a sort of fatness and like the Hill House was one of our first projects. Part of setting the window back was was acknowledging that we have really bad windows in America yeah, and, and, and not trying to put forward a kind of bad window as a kind of feature of a building um, was was a, a mode, of, mode of defense. But that building, that Hill House, for example, is a very complicated structural building. It just wasn't something that we wanted to put on display. There's a kind of thickness about um, how that cantilever works that we're absorbing structure in it such that you don't see it, but you kind of feel it spatially. And I think that would be something, um, I mean, the Manil building, is maybe one where um, you know it's the same module all the way through, but the structure gets expressed differently depending whether it's inside or outside. But the tolerances are incredibly, incredible. I mean, the thickness of the roof in the middle of the living room is literally like ten inches. So it, one of the most complicated details our engineers ever done, but it's not something that we want to reveal. We want you to sort of look elsewhere and not focus on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we, we have time for questions. You yeah. can open the floor. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your answer. Thanks. Thanks. Um, excuse me for my English, first. <laughs> and I was wondering about your phrase. You were saying always like building as a part of a conservation, mm -hmm. uh, which I really like. Mm -hmm. um, how did you connect that with the um, with the house? Like, did you think the house as a as a part of a installation, or it worked as something independent from? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's I think in a way those the, those ideas. Um, came almost before we really began thinking of um, this sort of art urbanism and it happened at the scale of the house and one thing that I didn't show you but you know probably with yeah as younger architects with time on our hands pretty much every house that I should I mean three or the three or four houses that I showed you there's a set of diagrams that look at for example the hill house sort of reimagined um, a really strict zoning envelope that dominates the hillsides in Southern California. And we thought we'd really invented this new way of thinking about it, which was like, which was by building with that envelope as opposed to sort of making a figure within the envelope. And so we did a master plan of all the houses in the neighborhood um, as with that figure. And even I think in the view house, we thought a lot about that. We thought given the logic of the house, which was, you know, upending the hierarchy of front and back and side. We, we, made, a, we made a plan that looked at um, a community that would be built upon um, the rules that we've established from that project. So I, I think even in those house projects, we're thinking a lot about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just to finish this idea of the constellation mm -hmm. and the house, I wanted to ask if the sensibility towards art and towards form, as I don't know if your clients are collector and are related, if you feel that it's a hard conversation with people who are not related to with the art world, if they understand this idea of the ambiguity of, of the form and so on. I think, you know, maybe it's a case of making different arguments for different audiences. Um, because you know ambiguity can be you know also an argument about adaptability or versatility. You know something that can be many things at once can be a highly functional type of space. And so, but I mean I, I think it also raises um, you know I mean, maybe it's partly also our, our work as educators that you know we spend a lot of time um, you know looking at architecture with our clients. We try to travel with them if there's the budget to do that. You know we try to. You know, this is what I was saying at the beginning about building a community and a discourse of ideas. I mean, I think that's to get a client to take a journey with us. We feel we we need to invest a lot in um, in in creating a kind of common ground with them, and it's sometimes harder um, with clients that are maybe less acclimated to our ideas. But I think you know we're we we think it's really important to, to do that and to create uh, find a kind of common ground. Um, and yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's perhaps it's partly the, the work that we get is 
with people who are you know attuned to that. So I think it's um, somehow we create our own destinies too. You know. <laughs> Um, I was quite as mesmerized by your uh, by your residential work, uh, particularly uh, this morphological aspect, um, because of, of this contrast between uh, a quite simple exterior and this uh, this uh, well, extraordinary richness on mm -hmm. the inside. I think the best example of this is the vault house. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wanted to, to ask you, uh, what, what if you could have one, perhaps, or what, what is the process through which you are acting with shapes? Like, is it an intuitive approach? Is it a composition of one like one? <laughs> um, no, it's neither of those. But um, but it's a, I think it's an astute observation, and um, you know I think one reference point that I would share with you um, is the work of Adolf Loos. Maybe it's someone you guys have studied, but I think there's a quality in that work about a sort of decorum about the exterior of the building and a sort of abundance on the interior. And I think a lot of our work, maybe it's also part of this kind of collection being part of a fabric of things that there's a sort of intent to um, to acknowledge our neighbors, to somehow be part of something. And I mean, I, I didn't speak about it so much, but the vault house is... Um, in a neighborhood on the street along the beach that has, you know, houses of obviously varying, a lot of not so great houses, but there's some sort of um, somewhat classic Spanish houses and there's sort of a nod to that in the way that we thought about the, not the arch, but transforming the arch into a vault, into a volumetric space. And so it's, the planning of that house on the interior is not intuitive at all. It's really a rigorous planning exercise because part of what we were able to do and aligning all the rooms in the same way as there's almost no specific circulation space. It's all sort of rooms. And so thinking about how to not have leftover space uh, as part of the orientation of the house was, was part of what that integer of the vaulted room gave, gave us. It's, it's an absolute observation, and I think it's, um, I mean, it's something, you know, we 
we this this slide you know I, I think does capture in a way a sort of mode of looking back at things I mean that's something we do a lot we're always sort of looking forward and looking back on, on the other hand you know I think we we do find it sort of an imperative that we're um, we try to start every project with a blank table we, we, we try to distill the sort of paradigmatic problem of the project and let that take us where it will go um, and I think you know another it's it's right that the house is more traditionally a standalone piece. I mean, at least we haven't, we've, we're starting to do some housing, but but these early projects are singular. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things is about a shift in scale and what does that mean? And, and, and one of the ways that we've thought about it, like I think it's in the Manil and, and it's in UCLA, the, the warehouse project is using the roof as an organizer. So if before it was about singular objects, now we're thinking about um, the datum of the roof plane is something that can allow for, it can create coherence, but have a looseness within it. So maybe the intimacy of the in-between of like the living room or the courtyard is something about this, this in our bones about the single person, the human, the house, the, the, the room, I think it's the room. Um, but as the scale shifts, thinking of other organizing elements that can um, allow us to accommodate bigger scale spaces, um, you know, different kinds of tectonic problems that are about span and not about loading in the same way. Um, but it's, you know, it's something we're, as I say, we're asking ourselves, thanks for getting into our studio and um, uh, pointing out our, our problems. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, I think it's, I think that's also why we, we, um, we want to keep doing houses because it kind of makes us kind of be a little bit schizophrenic. And I think that is good for our, us to keep challenging um, qualities at different scales of work that we're involved in. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Sharon. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>